Recorded live. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our series on the Hannibal Lecter movies with Red Dragon, directed by none other than Brett Ratner of X-Men 2. Bear in mind that if you haven't seen... X-Men 3, movie, son. Was it X-Men 3? Here's X-Men I thought it was, 3. Was, oh, yeah, and the Three Rush Hour Three seconds in and Jason's already been schooled. And the, the, the Rush Hour films, but, it, but <laughs> well, who did X-Men 2? You know what? I, I, Brian I totally, Singer. Brian Singer, of course. Okay, well, I apologize about that. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans we have. So, warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of The Iron Thane, an epic in the world of Shakespeare's Macbeth, available now in Kindle and paper with me from Austin, is Mr. Drew Edwards, the guy who knows the career of Brett Ratner, editor-in-chief of horrormovies.net, writer for Rockabilly Online, and creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. I must just look like somebody that knows movie trivia because we were we were at the pool earlier, and a group of random punk rockers asked me uh, who directed <laughs> RoboCop, and were very impressed when I knew who it was, or even wow. more impressed when I could tell them that it was, he was the same guy that made Starship Troopers. <laughs> wow, that's so funny that you get get approached by like. Movie curious punk rockers at the public pool. <laughs> Robocop, Robocop was the first movie that Jason and I ever went to together. That's right. That was our first date. Well, they said you just got to bump up. It wasn't a opinion. date because it was Robocop, but it was it was a movie. Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> Robocop is a date. It's a date. No. There's. There no. Are, no. But you didn't. He didn't feel that way about me. That was 1985. <laughs> no. And yet here we are. <laughs> yeah. No, trust, trust me, this this conversation happens all the time where I'm like, yeah, he didn't even know I existed. And he's like, hey, I married you, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, I apologize. It was 1987. I'm sorry. Yep. It was 1987. So mm-hmm. anyway. <laughs> um, Your move, Jason. Yeah, moving back into modern day where, where seated poolside, Drew is being approached by curious punk rockers who want to know who directed RoboCop which came out in 1987, apparently. Um, and we were 15, just in case anybody's curious. Thanks, also, thanks for that. Also in Austin, <laughs> Amy Barnett. <laughs> you were children. <laughs> Babes. We're telling oh, everyone at my age. No, I didn't awful. think of it that way. I just uh-huh. said it was, you know, no more talking for me. Okay. <laughs> Also in Austin, interesting podcast. Jamie Barr is a musician, pinup model, educator, and the lead vocalist and upright bassist for Austin's premier all-female rock and roll band, Danger Cakes. You can find out about their latest shows and their album, Quarter Life Crisis, at www.dangercakes.net. Hello, Jamie. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Oh, no, we're so happy to have you back. Did you happen to catch Robocop in his first run? She was like three. Uh, no, I was four. four. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, that's yep. fine. That's fine. I think and that would be considered abuse. Yep. <laughs> I mean, maybe. My parents let me see aliens. I think it was considered abuse when I was 15, too. So. <laughs> oh. And uh, finally, also in Denver, as always, color commentary from that great Paul Verhoeven fan, attorney. <laughs> since, since I'm already giving Jason a hard time, I'll say since he introduced himself as the author of The Iron Thane, that that book, the first version of it, he wrote it when we got married or right before we got married, and um, and he killed off my character. So that was fun. And then yes, he rewrote the book. Julia. He rewrote a version of killed. it now. And he goes, hey, I decided to take your character out since it bothers you so much that, you, that I killed her off. And um and I renamed her and then I didn't kill her. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute! It was not that I objected to having a character named after me. It's that I objected to her being dead. So there's that. So yay! <laughs> I'm glad you're excited that the Iron. I think we should do an episode of, on Robocop around Valentine's Day. Be real yeah. romantic. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be really funny, I think, to try to recreate whatever the hell it was that we talked about. Like, if you were to capture, like, what was the conversation, you know, after RoboCop at the Olive Garden or wherever the hell we went you know, in 1987. Guys. 
<laughs> if there was, if there was, if there was, if there was like marinara sauce involved, it was definitely a date. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you imagine? I, I wish I could just capture like what random crap would we have talked about? I, I have no idea, and you know, but it would be so fun to just like have a little tape recorder following you around and 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 find out, or maybe it wouldn't, you know, maybe it, you'd just be like, oh. Sorry. But today, we're not talking about RoboCop. No, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> Red Dragon is a 2002 American psychological horror. Thank you, Julia. Based on Thomas Harris's novel of the same name, featuring psychiatrist and serial killer Dr. Hannibal Lecter, it is a prequel to The Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal. The novel was originally adapted, and this is kind of confusing and will be fun to discuss in the film Manhunter, 1986. The film was directed by Brett Ratner, who we discussed made X-Men 3 and not 2. The one that people don't like as much, and written for the screen by Ted Talley, who also wrote the screenplay for the Oscar-winning The Silence of the Lambs. That's something this movie really has going for it. It stars Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, a role he played twice before, Edward Norton as FBI agent Will Graham. It also stars Rafe Fiennes. How do we say this? Okay. Harvey Keitel, Emily Watson, Mary Louise Parker, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. So that's a heck of a cast. You know what? Um, Let's mix it up. We haven't done it this way in a while. Opening thoughts. Let's this time go Drew. Julia, Jamie, and I'll go. So, Drew, you can kick it off. Um, what are your opening thoughts about Red Dragon? I, I have complicated thoughts about this movie. Um, I do enjoy it, although I think it is kind of a Xerox of the style of uh, Silence of the Lambs, only it's an inferior copy, to be sure. Um, it's a much more pedestrian film than Hannibal, so I don't think I like it even as much as that, even though I will say the script is definitely tighter. Um, the funny thing about this movie, and that we were, we were just watching the commentary before calling in, um, that they were painstaking about this movie not being as violent huh. as Hannibal or Silence of the Lambs, and yet my first reaction upon watching this for the first time in years is that I feel like this movie feels a lot more exploitive than the other two. Um, So it's interesting. It's interesting, especially how it stacks up against uh, Manhunter. Um, I'm really, really impressed with uh, Edward Norton. And of course, uh, Anthony Hopkins did an amazing job of uh, rejuvenating himself to look like the the lector of 11 years before he did he did yeah. a really i don't know about that <laughs> I, okay well, I don't know. we should all be so lucky <laughs> yeah all right excellent thank you very very much uh julia what are your opening thoughts on red dragon i feel like red dragon is kind of like for me you know how people always talk about, I don't know if this is true for Chinese food, but people always talk about how you eat Chinese food and then it's really filling, but then you forget about, like, it's you're, you're hungry, you know, like 10 minutes later or whatever it is. Yeah. I, I don't actually have that experience with Chinese food. To me, it's pretty fill, filling. But that metaphor fits here because, and it's kind of like the same thing with the Bourne identity movies, the Bourne movies, uh, Jason Bourne movies. Yes. They, I always love them when I'm watching them, and then I, I'm like, what was that movie about again? Like, an hour later. That's what... Red Dragon is for me. It's like, I know I liked it, but I, I, I had to, like, just having watched it a couple of days ago, I had to be like, wait, what, what, what happened again? You know, just trying yeah. to remember. It just kind of just what goes it goes right through me. So I like it, but it doesn't stick with me. It's not memorable <laughs> like Silence of the Lambs is. Excellent. Jamie, where are you landing on this one? Um, I like the movie. I was saying earlier, you know, it's, I would say... You know, Science of the Lamb is my favorite, but this is probably, you know, second in line. Um, I like the love story, and I like Ralph, um, or Ray Fine, sorry, not Ralph. I mean, he's probably fine, too, in his other movies, but <laughs> this is Ralph and Ray Fine. Um, but uh, I think he's great in this role. Um, I know Drew kept saying while we were watching it that he didn't, seem to have the presence of the the red dragon that he should have been a bigger man um in stature and you know they kept talking about how strong he looked but you know 
He's like, I don't think he looks so strong. I thought he looks pretty strong. <laughs> I think uh, he has the ability to seem scary and yet endearing, all, like, you know, almost simultaneously, which makes it all the more chilling, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. The, the Red Dragon, which is the central bad guy of, of this thing, which is Ray Fiennes here, I, it is impossible for me to watch this film without thinking of Tom Noonan in the 1986 original. It's very difficult. This, this is one of, for me, watching this movie is one of the strangest experiences because it's like confusing different versions of Hamlet or, or something like that that run through your head. And, and, you know, you're like, wait, which one was Derek Jacoby in? Was he in the one with Mel Gibson or was he in the one with Kenneth Branagh? And it's sort of like that. It's like, wait, wait, wait which one had William Peterson? But, you know, and and as uh, we were talking about beforehand, there's some recasting going on here for the universe that it's in. All told, though, this is exactly what I asked for last week. Last week I said, I don't like Hannibal. It deviates too much from the, from the formula. I want another one where FBI agent consults Hannibal Lecter. That's all I want. So that's what this movie gets me, and I'm happy with that, and I wish they had just done, like, three or four more. I'm perfectly happy to return to this this dark Baltimore world, you know, it's it's not nearly the piece of art that Silence of the Lambs is, but, you know, it's pretty darn good. If you're going to go watch a Silence of the Lambs knockoff, it may as well be one that is actually in the Silence of the Lambs universe. That was my thought. So, uh, you know, let's let's get into it. I am really curious about the very strange history of this film. Um, you know, so rather than go down the whole plot of the movie, I thought it would be useful if we just talk about <clears throat> to start with, why? Th- okay, here's all I'll say, and then Drew or whoever wants, else wants to pick up on it, go, man. This movie comes out a year, one year, maybe a little bit less after the re- release of Hannibal. In other words, I looked up from Hannibal, which I didn't really like, and all of a sudden there was another Hannibal Lecter movie coming out, which was Red Dragon, which nobody had even, like, I was barely aware that it was being made. I don't understand where it came from or how they decided to make it. And, you know, does anybody know, does anybody have a clue, like, how, why it was they wound up remaking The Red Dragon? I, this was not, I'm right. sure that, I, I, you know, I'm not enough of an aficionado of the Lecter series to to get completely in on you know, the, the complete ins and outs of the history here. But, I mean, no doubt, you know, Silence was a big hit. Hannibal was a big hit. Dino De Laurentiis had the rights to Red Dragon. I'm sure he wanted yeah. to to make uh, use of it. I do know from the commentary that they had to convince Anthony, like, like they, they hired Brett Ratner to be the director. Yeah. And he had his meetings with the producers and everything. And he had to convince them because they were, he's not – you know, this is a guy that's mostly known for making some slapsticky Jackie Chan movies and some and sure. some light comedies, and yeah. you know, not a, not a not a horror director, or you know, certainly not a, a name director on the level of, of Ridley Scott. Um, and so he had to fight to get this movie, and then he had subsequently had to go to Anthony Hopkins' New York home and convince Anthony Hopkins that uh, this was a good idea to do. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people were saying, well, they already made this story. It was Manhunter. It was actually pretty good. Um, why do that again? Especially why do it again if you can't get Anthony Hopkins, because that's really the only reason to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he had to convince Anthony Hopkins that his – Relation, Lecter's relationship with Will Graham it was different enough from his relationship with Clarice to make this sound appealing to him. And, and to give him something interesting to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're totally right, because when you think about it, this movie, and, and after we discuss this a little bit, we should talk about the opening of this film, but this movie is very much the same movie that Red Dragon was, I mean, sorry, that Manhunter was, and so that means that you're right. If there's no Anthony Hopkins, there's literally no reason for this movie to exist. And it, it should be said that you know, look, I like I know you know, 
Mo- movie hipsters can suck it. Like, I, I like Brian Cox <laughs> as Hannibal Lecter, but people who are saying that he is as memorable as oh. Anthony Hopkins in this part, they're full of it. So, um, no, I wouldn't say he's as memorable. It's not no, the I'm, same thing. I'm saying, I'm saying he's not as memorable. No, I know. There's a, there, there, it's interesting, and we're going to discuss Manhunter next week, by the way. But, I mean, there has, ever since really, I guess since Signs of the Lambs came out, there has been this ongoing hipster, actually before they were called hipsters, but there's been this sort of, of party game know-it-all conversation about like whether Brian Cox is really a superior Hannibal, and I think, you know, we we'll probably have appreciation for him. But it's Brian, hard to make Brian that. Brian Cox is a fine actor. Like I, I, oh, I, fantastic. yeah, but 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 these are Anthony fine films. Hopkins is this, Anthony Lambs. Hopkins is this character, right? That, that, that's that's the thing is that, I mean, that movie is an amazing Michael Mann picture. Okay, that's it a cop movie though. It's, right, right, it's fabulous, fabulous, and we're, and, you know. But uh, it's it's absurd to go arguing that it, arguing that you like Brian Cox better than Hannibal than uh, than Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter is like arguing that you only listen listen to the early stuff of your favorite band. I mean, it's it's just this sort of I don't know. It's it's this overly cloying know it all kind of thing. Now people are going to come on our site. And tell us that we're completely full of shit for saying that. So, you know, so we will. This conversation, no doubt, I will, will defend on. my position. <laughs> well, here is my question, though. This movie is clearly. I mean, the reason why it was worth doing is that you know, when you think about it, this cycle of films, um, which to me are uh, held together, I guess, by Anthony Hopkins. Um, this cycle of films are all one universe. And the Michael Mann movie is a different universe. So it totally makes sense that you would go ahead and do Red Dragon in this universe, even though it doesn't matter that they have got the same producer, because Dino De Laurentiis is in, is is he actually involved in this production or, or is he yeah. Yeah, no, he is. He is. Yeah. So he I mean, produced the like, first one too. Just like doing the origin stories for Spider Man and whatever other superheroes. Oh Christ. Yeah. One. In fact, how close together are Spider Man? Like the ten first years? One. I think 10 years. Spider-Man 1 came out in 2002, and The Amazing Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man came out in 2012, so exactly 10 years, yeah. This one, it you, you was... Would think, you would think that I actually know my superhero. That was brilliant. That was I really good. I, I, I wish that we had put <laughs> something on that. Um, so this one, 86 to 2002, so is longer. Anyway, I mean, that's that's like five, so it's completely plenty of time. Yeah. To do a to do a remake, um, you know you're right, and and just like you know the Batman cycle that uh, Tim Burton produced and then Joel Schumacher picked up is a different Batman cycle from from the uh, the one with Christian Bale. And James so, Bond. But James Bond is a complicated one because mm-hmm. James Bond is one long cycle, I would argue, up until the point that uh, that uh, Daniel Craig comes along. And again, my theory, as I've told you, is that this orig- this Daniel Craig, the the uh, Skyfall, is actually the origin story for James Bond, and that all the other James Bonds are just uh, people who have taken on the James Bond persona, because that's just another alias for 007. And so you just you just come on as 007, and and your other name is James Bond. It doesn't matter what your name was before, but you're named after the original guy who was. The guy with the big Skyfall house. All of that is great. But anyway, <laughs> that's clearly in one universe, yes. a shared universe. Um, and, you know, so anyway, what I was wondering is, like, what exactly, you know, at how many elements would they have to lose here for this for this um, not to count? Cause Wait, but you said it's the same universe, but isn't Blofeld, doesn't Blofeld show up twice in two different movies? Uh, With completely different. Well, there's a number of different Blofelds played by different actors. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Right. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, Donald Pleasance, Charles Gray. I don't know why we're just. Discuss- never mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Proceed. <laughs> Carry on. Um, but you're you're right. I mean, that get that gets to the actual point here. You could have a movie in this universe, the Sons of the Lambs universe, and have characters recasted clearly because we already saw Julianne Moore take the place 
of uh, Clarice Starling. Oh, yeah. And yeah. this one, you've got another replacement, which is, Drew, you were talking about this beforehand. <laughs> well, they have Scott Glenn in Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Who is playing, um, no, I'm blanking on the character's Crawford. name now. It's Crawford, yeah. Jack Crawford, Jack Crawford. And then in this movie, which is supposed to be a few years before Silence yeah. of the Lambs, he's suddenly Harvey Keitel. And I was very troubled by that for some reason, like even more troubled than Jody have been with Jody Foster turning into, um, yeah. yeah, Like, because Scott Glenn plays Jack Crawford as this very sort of almost cerebral guy. Um, he's very different than, you know, like, I love Harvey Keitel, but Harvey Keitel is in the movie. He's going to play every character as kind of a, a tough guy type. Absolutely. And that's exactly yeah. how he plays Jack Crawford. Even if and, he's working a desk job, he's a tough desk job. Absolutely. Yeah. He's physically so, bigger. Yeah. Age is about right. I think the age is fine. Yeah. I, I, age is probably sync up okay. I just, I wish they would have gotten Scott Glenn back. Like, I yeah. just, you know, like, I do not believe that those two people are the same guy. Like, right. I, I have a very hard time wrapping my, my brain around, like, okay, these are supposed – like, Harvey Keitel didn't even bother to wear glasses. Right. If they had chosen another skinny guy and put him in octagonal glasses, you probably would have gone, okay, sure, fine, that's Crawford. You know, we get it. Like like on the soap operas, when a character gets replaced, they usually just add another actor who looks superficially like the, like the, the actor that they had before, and, and you just go. Um, yeah, so so at this point, that means that shared from the original series, you no longer have Clarice. You have a different Crawford. The only connective tissue is Anthony Hopkins. And I, in my mind, actually, the only connective tissue... And Barney. Um, and Barney. And Barney. And, uh, no, and you are Chilton. Yeah. So really, in fact, it's the correctional facility. It's the, it's the, the mental hospital or whatever the hell it is that, that they've got Lecter in that cell that dungeon that's the connective tissue of this universe that's the thing that is in all of these movies even more so than anthony hopkins because when i close my eyes and go what is it about that series it's the damn uh stones you know the dungeon walls that, that we find him in um yes so you know i, I was i was thinking about like, oh and chilton chilton's the same chilton is the same yeah yeah, yeah absolutely um you know, I've seen movies where they where by the time you get to the sequel, oh, we've got a we've got an echo. Oh, they know. Is it still there? Mm-mm. No. Okay. I've seen movies where by the time you get to a sequel, there's literally nothing shared. I mean, like for instance, um, I forced Julia to watch Peyton Place and Return of Peyton Place. Same universe, and yet they recast every single character from one movie to the next. And yet you have no doubt that you're watching the same one. So so it, it can be done. All right. Anyway, this movie at the beginning um, has, uh, before, we, before we get to Edward Norton, this movie at the beginning includes a whole sequence that is not in the either the book or in the Manhunter. And the reason why, of course, is that they've got Anthony Hopkins to be a lead, and so they want him to have more screen time. Um, Julia, you commented, by the way, that he didn't actually have a lot of screen time in Science of the Lambs. Isn't that right? Right. Um, well, I mean, in, in yes, he's got. I think he's got the least number of minutes on screen of any Oscar winner, or, or maybe the second least, something like that. But you know, both in both movies, in this one and the other one, he only has four scenes with you know in the first one with Clarice, and then this one with Will. Even though it feels because he's so, because because um, Anthony Hopkins is so. Um, you know, just how amazing and memorable. It feels like he's in the whole movie. Well, I mean, he's in more of it than, than just what he's in with Will, Will Graham, but still, it seems like they have more scenes together than they do. Yeah. Um, but he's just great. I, I don't agree that he looks... I mean, I, and there's nothing to be done about it. He's 10 years older. But I don't agree that he looks the same as he did before. He does look fit, and that's great, but he just looks older. You know, and that's just it. He's a little, he's a little, got a little bit more lines, but I think he did a really good job of like physically rejuvenating. Like you compare this the way he looks in Hannibal, he looks yeah. a lot younger. 
That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Hannibal, he did. He was fatter, jollier, you know, balder, all that stuff. So you're you're totally right. They introduce because this is a prequel to Silence of the Lambs. They they introduce us to Hannibal Lecter back when he was just a a very wealthy psychiatrist and patron of the arts, and we find him in the middle of one of his serial killings. Basically, he he is annoyed at the performance of one of the musicians in the orchestra that he is a patron of, and he uh, I guess this is the some Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, and he's having the board. Uh, over to dinner, and apparently he has murdered and is serving them uh, parts of the. Was it a violinist? I'm actually trying to remember the the nature of the musician that, that he was. <laughs> yeah, I think it was it was, it was, it was, it was, it was the loudest. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's he's actually a yeah. He's a musical instrument that already sounds like food, and yet it's a flute. I, I, it's, I he's playing that. the flute. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's no. out of tune. He was just the one member of the orchestra that kind of Lecter was just totally annoyed by. Yes. Because yeah. he kept going. He didn't know his part accurately. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hannibal Lecter's sense of hearing is so acute that he can No, out anybody's sense of hearing is acute enough to hear that that guy was crap. Right. Maybe you're right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're totally right. Um, but I love this notion that he would pick somebody out and 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 then murder him and serve them up as foie gras to, to, <laughs> to all the to, discerning music. Yeah. <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we find him and he's such an epicurean. You know, he's serving his his uh, his flautist and he's like quoting from <laughs> poetry and and he's just being super <laughs> slick basically. And then um, you know, he sees his guest home and into the room walks. A character that we last saw played by William Peterson, and in this case, it is Edward Norton. It's FBI agent Will Graham, and Will and and th- it's so funny to have Edward Norton in this role because Norton, um, Norton is to me, it, you know, I, I don't know it, what you might see in other films, but he's here giving an extremely minimalist performance. You know, he's very wound up all the time. He's very sort of tense. And uh, he's got this sometimes more realistic than other times blonde hair that, that uh, you know. Yeah, I didn't love that. It's crazy. Ed, Edward, For all I know, Edward Norton might be bald, and this could be a hairpiece. I have, I have no idea, you know. No, they bleached it. It was his hair, and they bleached it. Because presumably uh, he lived in a, in a climate where, this is what it says on IMDb anyway, he lives in a climate where there's a lot of sun, so, so therefore his hair would be lighter, which is total baloney because, I mean, yeah, it would be lighter if you were blonde, but a brunette doesn't suddenly become a blonde. No, it's not true. He won't go super skin. blonde, but if you have, like, lighter brown hair, like a chestnut color, you'll go you'll go and get, like, blonde. Well, you think it'll... Well, his hair did not look realistic to me. It'll it'll turn. To, it, it's tough to get to this sort of honey wheat color that that uh, <laughs> that he has. It, anyway, I found it distracting because it didn't look to me like like hair. I mean, I I've just never known anybody to have this particular color. You um, know, and I, it's the yeah. same hair that what's his face has in Manhunter though. Does did they give? Um, did he's they got give some. If I, if I remember correctly, he's got some frosted blonde hair, and that's really funny. I, well, I, I think look, Edward Norton is less cheesy than the guy in Manhunter. Like I can't. It, it like, may well be. I, I that 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 may well be. Also, that was '86. So it's very possible. Like if William Peterson looks like he deliberately got a perm and a bunch of like frosted, like edges, all this crap, that would be one thing. Um, I'm just saying, I don't know. I've seen a lot of blondes in my day. <laughs> but, well, maybe like, it's supposed to be that the character bleaches his hair, though. It's not out of question. Well, Seymour Hoffman's hair, now that's real blonde, man. That sort of dirty, icky, gray blonde that every member of my family has. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's icky at all. I think your family has very nice hair. Um, I think that Philip Seymour Hoffman is icky, but that's for different reasons, not right. because of Well, anyway... Hair. The, uh, okay, but getting back to Edward Norton and his, his performance as Will Graham. So Will Graham, it's really, he plays um, Will Graham as kind of a sweetheart, I mean, in a way. 
he's come to consult with his brilliant uh, consultant, uh, you know, um, Hannibal Lecter. Forensic psychiatrist. Yes, forensic psychiatrist who's helping him work on a serial killer case that that uh, that they've been working on, and clearly he enjoys this sort of mentor-mentee relationship. And if you think about it, he's probably, you know, he's a government agent. He probably doesn't make a lot of money, and it's kind of nice to sort of go into this very sort of swank world of this psychiatrist and sit in nice armchairs and, and talk about brainy things. So here's my question. Does he, when he walks in to his house, does he, at that point, when they have this conversation um, about, well, you know, when 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 they have the, the, the fight, does he um, already know that, or does he really strongly suspect that uh, the lector is the, the killer? killer? And if so, then why is he so unprepared? I, he doesn't. I don't think he realizes Hannibal Lecter is the killer until he picks up the cookbook and sees the recipe for sweetbreads, and then he makes the connection. Yeah, but he says the whole thing about how well. How come you didn't get that he had that he was eating the people? That seems like something that you should have come up with. Well, I, I'll tell you what happens in the book. Mm-hmm. So I think Jamie is exactly right in this in this scene. The way I'm reading it, Will is just sort of grasping and thinking through things, and he hasn't figured it out. And it's not until he comes across the cookbook that he he thinks, "Oh, wait a minute." Which I love that. I I loved that (laughs) that aspect of as a chef, like that. I love that. That's how Hannibal Lecter gets found out. Like that, it's his recipe book for people. I thought that was great. She serves me sweet bread. Sweet bread. Oh, we, we've got a we've got an echo. Does anybody have like a second speaker going? I'm sorry. The um, huh? I don't know what's causing that. Okay, and now it's not. Uh, but okay. So Jamie, what are sweet breads? I'm sorry, and if, if this is embarrassing, I apologize. But the uh, but what the if you're a cook, what is a sweet what are sweet breads? Do you know? Does anybody know? Oh, it's I, don't the, know. It's, I think it's the thalamus of. Really like okay. The thalamus. Okay. So, um, but basically, I mean, it's organ. Pancreas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thymus or the pancreas. Yes. All right. Very good. So, in other words, in other Which, words, I don't understand why it's called sweet bread. But small organs. Well, it's just one of those. One of those. Like, yeah. It's, it's that's like a Scottish cooking. term. Yeah. Um, so, all right then. Uh, excellent. He, he's he's pulling out. So he would be cooking things like the liver and the pancreas and, and stuff like that. Um, which, by the way, as a southern boy, I find some of that stuff to be good eating. But um, <laughs> but it's just... <laughs> um, all right. So anyway, in the book, this does the not have... Fried green tomatoes. It, in, in the, oh, yeah. At the, what was that? At the Whistle Stop <laughs> Cafe? I believe that that's from Fried Green Tomatoes, wrong cannibalistic movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in the um, in the original book, what happened was uh, Grant, and this all happens in flashback, and it's a very tiny scene. It, it doesn't it doesn't play out as the whole prologue. It's literally just told somewhere along the way in Red Dragon, and it's that uh, Graham is consulting with Lecter, and he comes across a, I think it's even a poster, but regardless, it's a diagram. It's a diagram that Lecter has of something called Wound Man which was a diagram that they had come up with in the Civil War to indicate all the different possible wounds that you might need to um, work on if you were a battlefield surgeon. So you've got, like, broken bones and severed limbs and yada, yada. And, but they're all diagrammed out on one body. And one of the bodies that they had found, he says, again, this is in flashback, uh, had exhibited all of these wounds and been displayed. And now Graham is hanging out in Lecter's study, and he comes across this diagram, and he instantly just intuits, oh, my God, Lecter's the killer, and he did that whole thing as a way of, of recreating this particular image. And Lecter is standing right behind him and intuits, oh, my God, uh, Will Graham just now realized that I'm the killer. And it's literally at that moment that the, the two realize that they have to be enemies and they – nearly kill one another. And it's, so at that point, it's exactly like this. To be honest with you, this is better. I mean, the, 
the whole thing here with the sweetbreads and the cannibalism and, and everything feels much more a part of the Silence of the Lambs universe as the movies have defined it than the way it was presented in the book. You know, and I think that's just with the benefit of hindsight, whereas, you know, the, <laughs> the original Red Dragon, sometimes you get the impression that Thomas Harris is, hasn't quite yet figured out some of the stuff that, or as Drew has called it before, early episode weirdness. You know, mm -hmm. the, some of the cannibalistic stuff, for instance, just wasn't there in the first book. Um, so, anyway, we flash forward and Graham, oh, and, and, and they established one more thing which is that Graham, who once again is played by a to as a total sweetheart, possesses tremendous imagination, very personal imagination, such that he is able to think like the killer, to put himself sort of in, a, in the perfect frame of mind of what the killer would want to do. Um, now, here's my problem with this, and, and you guys can tell me if this is unfair. By now, so long into this whole realm of serial killer stuff, Saying that your character is plagued by being able to think like the killer is literally, it's like table stakes. It's the most obvious problem that a main character can have. Whereas it might have been really unique in the time that Red Dragon was written. By the time the movie Red Dragon comes out, that's not, that, it doesn't feel that special. Does anybody else feel this way? No. No. <laughs> I didn't think it was Sorry. like that he was that special either like that it was like I just thought he was somebody who was good at his job like it wasn't like oh he's got he's got a gift like he just is able like I know they're like making it seem like nobody else can do this well like you know we need yeah. you Will but which could be true I mean, well he's I, mean, an expert. I, I, I accept what Drew says like no this is still and besides in a way you think like I'm sick of seeing Batman's origin, but if you go to something that presents it in a good way, you're like, okay, I can get into this again. Or like I said, how many times can I watch Hamlet? And, and you know, you get into it if somebody can can tell it well. So, yeah, I, you know, that's the argument why they should go ahead and make the Case Carpetta novels, even though by now we've seen Well, I, I love the, um, yeah, this is like a, he can think like the killer. There's a great, the best, one of the best lines or best exchanges in the movie is later on when he's talking to Lecter in his cell, and Lecter says, oh, well, the, if you caught me, therefore you must be smarter than me. And he goes, no, Dr. Lecter, I would never presume that I was smarter than you. And he, Lecter, he's, Lecter's like, well, then how did you catch me? And he's like, well, I have certain, you have certain disadvantages that I don't have. And he's like, such as, well, you're insane. <laughs> and I, I think the thing that Will Graham has is that he can put himself into this mindset where he can find the logic into in what other people might think is completely illogical of a, a the mind of a lunatic. Yeah. But then he then he can put it right back into the rational world of a of a sane detective. So that's that's to me, you know, when they talk about him having imagination, like that's that's really what they're they're saying. You know, you can you can yeah. think like a lunatic, but then pop back into sane guy. Where, and you know, certainly the scene where he's he's going through the, you know, like some of the stuff is so on the nose, like the jump scares they have, where suddenly you know he's seeing what happened to the family. Like that's just a little a little again, exploitive and corny, but, you know, certainly they do a good job of like establishing that he can, he can connect with this, this yeah. killer and, 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 and in a certain way. Without being made crazy, you know, without, yeah. well, well, not necessarily because it is something that troubles him. As you it just troubles said. him. Yeah. And that's why he desires to, go on vacation. I mean, if you, I mean, not on vacation, that's why he wants to retire. If you think about somebody, let's say you're one of these FBI agents who does nothing but deal with child molesters. Those guys do burn out. It does, you know, they don't necessarily go crazy, you know, but they're like, look, I just can't do this anymore. I, I've, I've seen as much of this as I can humanly allow myself to see. 
and you get the impression that's what's happened to him is, is he's like, I'm just, I'm just done. And so I'm going to go to Florida and fix boats. And they come to him and they're like, well, you're better than that guy. We have a Johns Hopkins. We, we need you. Um, yeah, I find I'm remi- I can't wait till this to discuss Manhunter next week, because again, I find his character of Will Graham to be so incredibly innocent. You know, there's something really vulnerable about the way that, um, the way that Edward Norton plays this character, that's very different from the wise-ass kind of, uh, you know, super cop that William Peterson played. Um, at least that's the way I remember it. I mean, we're, we're going to see next week if, if that's true. Um, so, yes, we find uh, Will fixing boats, and then um, the problem is we have a new serial killer very, very early. I thought this was very interesting. Well, one thing I do like about, you know, no matter how much this one's deviating, they're still going to follow the book, at least here. And um, it's very technical and cop-like, where Crawford has two killings, just two. And so he is basically betting that this is that these are so similar that there's definitely going to be another one. There's no guarantee about that at all. You have You have you have an array of two, and and it could stop right there. But that's kind of cool. It's you know he's noticed these identical killings, far apart. That's the mystery. Is come back, help me, help me figure out these these murders. Um, and so Will's gonna come back, work on that, and when he's stumped, he's gonna go to Lecter to figure it out. Julia or uh, Jamie, we haven't heard from you very much. Would you like to? describe the nature of the murders like what is this new guy up to the tooth fairy oh well he's disfigured he's uh born with a cleft palate and you hear uh ellen burston actually the voice of his i guess his grandmother i'm assuming you're supposed to believe it was um like yes. chastising him and telling him how she's going to cut off his uh his little we can say penis. Men, we can, yeah, we can say penis, what, right? I was I like, I, I, you guys swear we can say penis, right? Okay. <laughs> no, but she, she just says, I think she just says I'm going to cut it off, right? It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. She doesn't ever say it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, she, she didn't ever right. say she it. So she calls him filthy, and, you know, and he's all having, like, his weird... It's kind of like a montage of going through this house that was actually built for the movie, even though it looks like it's something out of the, like deep south like a southern plantation um but and you know he's i believe that maybe they're her teeth you don't know whose teeth they are but he has no teeth on his uh upper gum line and he puts them in (laughs) and these teeth are like pretty scary looking little but Very jaggedy. Normal, yeah, he also has normal teeth that he wears for his day job or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. um but during the murders he puts in the teeth and he breaks into houses of well, so far it's been two I say so far. Two uh families, you know, individually like that and he murders them and usually doing some sort of rapey activity with the mother and he drags the bodies of everyone else into the room and breaks all the mirrors but and puts mirrors in their eyes so that they can watch him or he can at least watch himself as if they were watching him um, commit these horrible acts and he he bites them he bites the mother and with those scary teeth and yeah that's it's uh <laughs> thing with the, and the, so yeah so they're faced with these two suburban homes where the family's dead and in two different wack- states yeah yeah far away and this wackadoo thing where the guy has broken mirrors and taken pieces of the mirrors and put them in the eyes of the family to watch him so so the FBI is trying to figure out, okay, what's this guy's deal? What connects these two families? 
how did he decide to break in? You know, how did he decide on these on these families, and how is he going to pick his next uh, victim, assuming that he will? And they're pretty sure yeah. that he will. And um, because of that, the the bite marks, um, the police dub him the Tooth Fairy, right? Which is everything like he believes he is the Red Dragon, right? And that brings us to the sec the sort of B plot. Um, which, well, one of them. Actually, this movie has a number of, of plot threads. But the next big one is that, okay, so now Will Graham is back, and so now Freddie Lowndes, who is this um, sleazy reporter who likes to write articles about FBI agents, uh, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, wants, you know, wants interviews, wants to write about uh, about the, the crimes, and, and, you know, and, and of course, Norton... Like all good cops in the movies, has no no personal interest in being famous or anything like that. So he's and and by the way, I mean clearly that's the moral choice. But I mean I've never seen a hero cop in a movie ever be remotely tempted by publicity, which is kind of funny, um, because I think human people probably would be. Well, and the antagonists are always yes, interested yeah. In there's that. usually some guy like Chilton who's not per yes. se a bad guy but nevertheless is always interested in the publicity. Right. And they're the ones that we're supposed to look down on. And there, there, there's always an unspoken morality in these films. That you know what? Is. I want to see a movie that that goes against that, though. Yeah. Where you yeah. They, you could be publicity-minded and still be okay. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that would just mean that, – that would just be – you're you're responsible with the publicity. Like, you want to keep the public Yeah, you can you, – you can, you, there, there's a certain – I mean, I don't know. Like, I, 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 I feel like that that's a trope that I've grown. I mean, it works well enough here. Like, I'm not saying that I have a problem, but and obviously the reporter that Philip Seymour Hoffman plays, R.I.P. By the way, um, uh, he's a sleaze ball. Like, and you know, you're not like if you were to run across that guy in real life, you you wouldn't probably like him too much. And pretty much all the characters Philip Seymour Hoffman ever played yeah. were No, he did, he did play a bunch of sleazy <laughs> characters, although not in the boat that rocked. I thought he was really, really good in that. But, yeah, the... Um, uh, I, I agree in, with you now. He wanted to be dollar. He wanted to be dollar hide, by the way. Yeah, well, and, and he actually insisted that they they actually glue him to the chair in the scene where he's glued to the oh, chair okay. so that he could <laughs> be authentic. Method, uh, gee. Method, exactly. Just like, uh, did, they, did he insist that they actually light him on fire, too? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I don't think that was... <laughs> no, but he insisted that... So, ba- so backing up, though, backing up, we've kind of skipped uh, across no, the, but, the but story. Really quickly, I want to... I something that, that Drew just said. So I agree with you. It's wearying because you kind of realize there's an opportunity to do something else here, and and the movies aren't doing it when they just have this road sort of, oh, I don't believe in that. The only superhero I can think of who truly embraces... Publicity is, <laughs> Iron is, Man. No, Mr. Fantastic. And Iron Man. Yeah, Iron Man too. <laughs> but Mr. Fantastic embraces publicity because it keeps the family safe. Mm. That is his whole theory. Is is um, we are freaks, but if we embrace publicity and put on funny costumes and save the world and get in the paper all the time, then people will accept us. Well, it's because with the Fantastic Four, if you you they didn't have the public will to the the good public will to the X Men. Yes, because they're not they're not they're not, char- they're not charmingly weird like like the Avengers. They're just weird. The, the Avengers have a, a pretty pretty bad reputation. Um, well, but, the movies, uh, mix, I don't think the, Iron the Man's movies helping are it. mixing it all up. It's it's really hard, especially because you have this problem of right now the Avengers, the X Men, and the Fantastic Four in three different universes. Yeah. But before we digress into that, we were too late. Too late. Um, so, so yeah. So back to the uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman storyline. So they um, decide that they're going to try to draw out the um, Red Dragon by coming up with all these lies about him and just yeah, saying they have all a pretty stuff. good profile already. Yeah, yeah, it's saying all this stuff that's going to totally be insulting to him to try to draw him out. And how do they figure out that? Um, oh, somebody who's cleaning out. Um, the the cell of uh, Lecter so finds this 
note from the Tooth Fairy. Like they realize that they're. Yeah, but we're not. We're not, we're not does this yet. work for everybody? By the way, so these because are, these are I two have different to... big scenes. So I, I think we should start. We should do the Freddie Lounge thing, and then the one with the. But isn't the, the Freddie Lounge thing tied to that, or am I just? Uh, let's separate them though. Okay. Because because they are Drew raised a really good question, but I think we should separate the Freddie Lowndes public message embarrass the 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 tooth fairy. But that years. happened after they. She's right. That happened after they did. Okay, the, so we can do that one first. But, but I think we should do that, that first together. because it did not work for me that that he. <sighs> I don't buy that the, the the Tooth Fairy would write Hannibal Lecter a fan letter, essentially, because I don't think he thinks of himself as a serial killer the way Hannibal Lecter is a serial killer. Like, Hannibal Lecter knows, he is self-aware enough that he knows that he is a cannibal and he knows not everybody else is yep. running around doing that. Like, whatever his rationale in his head, you know, he knows that he is outside of the system. Whereas Dollarhide thinks he is mutating into a dragon. Yes. Like, okay, I don't think universe, he would think of himself as anything close to what Lecter is. Yeah, but in the, the in-universe explanation is that Dollarhide believes that that Lecter represents a, a more advanced kind of being that Dollarhide also is, and so they share that. But you're right. That's tenuous. Is that something oh, that's in the book? Because I don't know that they... Totally, they... Totally, this stuff is totally, totally in the book, and, and I actually never thought about what you're saying. That's a really, really good point. But, I mean, in the book, it's really just an excuse to show how awesome the FBI is. You know, because this is before Harris gets disillusioned by the FBI <laughs> in Hannibal. So at this point in his career, at least in his books, he thinks that the FBI are the most awesome people in the world. You know, So all of the cynicism of the last movie is gone here. In this case, they find a teeny tiny little bit of evidence. Um, some eagle-eyed person pulls something out of a trash can. And so now, with exactly an hour to spare, they they are going to literally move a piece of paper you know, across cities and do all kinds of technical mumbo jumbo with it, and then return it to the cell, all in like, all in all in literally an hour. It's a bullshit premise, but it's wonderful because it's just showing off, you know, how technically badass they are. This is this is no different from Jordy LaForge messing around with dilithium crystals. You just kind of like go with it, like bloody blah, blah. We're using chem chemistry and we're making things show up, and but it's great. Uh, yeah. But but you're right. The 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 premise that why would why would uh, Dollar Hyde be obsessed <laughs> with with Lecter? Fanboying out. Yeah. Mm. You know, just you just go with it because that's so, what Harris wanted. To so do. they figure out that Lecter must be also answering that the, the 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 piece the piece of the letter that's missing must instruct Lecter as to how to respond, and they determine somehow I don't remember how. That he's going to respond by putting taking out an ad, a personal ad in the Tatler, which is the paper that Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman writes for. By the way, how awesome is it that this movie came out in 2002? We said, and yet it has totally embraced the technical technological era that it takes place in, which is to say, like the late 80s or whatever the hell, because it's you know everything they're doing is delightfully low tech. You know, it's a world of fax machines and personal ads. nobody has a phone and personal ads and, and newspapers. Yeah, the idea that an actual local beat newspaper can be a thing and an actual career, you know, that this newspaper would still exist. I mean, all of that. Most well, of the they, stuff they do still exist. Yeah, there are still newspapers. <laughs> there, there are still newspapers. We've gutted the nation's newspapers. Most of the small papers have have just you know the the world the the reporters have just been devastating you know right a lot of no, time, but I, but they still do do exist I mean we get a paper just for our, our our town so anyway the point is though that this is a kind of a rag and and so he takes out personal ads to answer the question so they find his ad and and um, you know his his response but they don't know the code well how it's like what he's communicating anyway so they decide to go ahead and have 
um, Philip Seymour Hoffman do this article that tells a bunch of lies, yeah. knowing now that the that the um, Tooth Fairy reads that paper, and so for some reason that I don't understand, they assume that he's going to go after the the Tooth Fairy might go after Will Graham, but not that he's going to go after the journalist who said all the lies. Now, can I just point something out here? In in this one, Philip Seymour Hoffman is burned alive after reading a message. So so uh, the Red Dragon gives uh, Freddie Kid- Lowndes, the reporter, kidnaps him, yeah, yeah g- kidnaps him and gives him a manifesto to read to the police. You know, you I I will not be mer- merciful and yada yada. Uh, but and he dies and that's it. In the book, he actually survives this attack, so oh, he's gosh. able to be interviewed afterwards but by, he's been burnt by burnt. the FBI, and he, yeah, he's suffering from all of these burns. So he's just like the character in, uh, in Hannibal. Yes, yes, and and what he does is he points out that another thing that doesn't happen in this movie, that they all took a picture for the paper, and that Graham put, does anybody else remember this, that Graham put his hand on Freddie Lowndes' shoulder in the picture. And so when Freddie Lowndes is laying in the hospital giving his statement to the FBI, he says, Graham made me look like a fucking pet, meaning Graham knows now that that serial killer kills the pets first and that Graham deliberately set me up to be murdered mm, by the Red Dragon. Wow, it's cold. Well, it is cold, and actually there's some reason to believe it's true. <laughs> this, you know, the the, um, I, you know, Graham seems like a sweetheart, so maybe he wouldn't do that. But he's also super smart, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. I think it's I think it's ambiguous. Yeah. Well, else? Go ahead. I definitely think he was mad, but I don't think he did this on purpose. I think there was yeah. kind of a little bit of a vengeful, like, mean-spirited thing, but I don't think he... I think he just didn't care. Yeah, I don't think he, I'm sure he probably thought it would lure him, lure, um, you know, the Red Dragon out. But But I think it was super irresponsible of them not to put police protection on, on Phil Seymour Hoffman. Anyway, so he gets, so he gets, yeah, uh, set set on fire and just rolled down the street or whatever. (laughs) And, um. (laughs) Yeah, in the wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it's very soon after that that they, almost immediately, that they crack the code because they see that um, Lecter has sent a coded message back to um, back to Dollar Ride, yeah. which is a bunch of uh, bullshit Bible Bible verse citations, but it's actually just a code, and and it says um, the code tells the address. Of- <laughs> well, and by the way, the way he got this address, this is another thing that I wonder if it's actually true or not. Is that um, is that he uh, from prison? He he's able to make a phone call. I don't know to a lawyer or whoever, but he hangs up and then dials this phone that has no buttons or or dial by just clicking the the hang up thing, which of course we don't have anymore because we, nobody uses those kind of phones. But back in the day when you hang when you literally slammed a phone down to hang it up, that those the hang up button, he just clicks it a bunch of times. And to dial it, like he'll well, like he click the switchboard. If I recall, he gets no. the switchboard. No, no, he dials it by going one two three four, one two three four five six seven. Yeah, I have no one, idea. Three, that you know, like that, and I, then I've... he dials the phone number. And I'm like, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's a real true thing. But anyway, so that's how. Then yes, then he gets um, some kind of person. I don't even know who it is. Oh, he so weasels somebody. He gets in. like an uh, intern, a temp, a temp yeah. secretary. To tell him what the address for Will Graham for Will Graham, or at least the town. Like she doesn't know that the specific address, but the town. Is. So he's that's the message he sent to the paper. Is the town that Will Graham yeah. lives in? So now we know that Lecter is perfectly willing to sick Francis Dollaride on the family. Dollaride hasn't actually started going after the family at this point, but they they move the family out of danger, and then they continue the uh, the hunt. For uh, for Francis Dollaride, and, and at this point, actually, Lecter's almost really out of the equation as far as locating Dollaride, because the rest is just the brilliance of Will Graham. Will Graham figures out. Well, that, we spend a lot of time with with. They actually spend quite a bit of time with 
Francis Dollarhide. In fact, for a certain point, he almost yeah, becomes the, whole the main character. Of the, yeah. Yeah, we With should the, actually, uh, actually talk about that. They, <laughs> they yeah, um, uh, really quickly, they, Graham figures out, um, okay, somehow or another, the, it's it's probably somebody who has actually seen the family video. So anyway. Well, he's got the video for the one family. Yeah. And he's like, H- how do they know? How did he? Why did he bring a bolt cutter when the door no longer has a a a, a, um, a padlock, but in this video it has padlock, and he knows all this other stuff. He knows the dog's not gonna. He knows whose yeah. dog, it, which dog it is, even though he doesn't have a tag. All of a sudden, it's as if he's inside the house, and then it kind of clicked dawns on him that maybe he's seen the video. So he calls about the other family and goes, yeah. does the other family have a video? And then they figure out, yes. So, so, now so he knows now so that he yeah. works for this company. So now let's go and talk about Dollar Ride, who gets his own, like, half hour or whatever it is. He gets a lot of scenes. And he's well-deserving of it because Ray Fiennes is awesome. He's so okay. good. So, so this is actually a really creative concept. Um, uh, does anybody want to explain the the sad, sad story of Francis Dollaride, lovelorn uh, employee of a video processing <laughs> business? Reba, the blind, <laughs> the blind photo developer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he works here. You know, he's involved in some kind of technical business. Well, worked- of, I mean, it, but it's at this it's at this place that that just converts videos. They take videos that people send in, and he converts them into VHS so they can watch right. them on, so, their, on their VCRs. So he meets a girl. He delivers, like, film. That's that's right. what his job is. Yeah. He meets a girl who's blind, and so he, because he's very self-conscious, I guess, about the cleft. Yeah. Uh, is he is saying why is a blind girl working in a, in a place that deals with photography? I... I well, she doesn't that, have anything to do with that part. She I'll tell you exactly why, Drew, because she works in a dark room. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, it's it's this interesting thing where she's got labels. This is actually doesn't work as well in the 2002 version where everything is VHS. But in the original version, everything was chemicals and, and, and film. And although you're totally right that she still couldn't actually view the final film by holding it up to – a red lamp like they do in all the old movies. It doesn't matter. The point is he meets the girl. It's that's like I didn't remember that she worked there except for the fact that they at some point figure out her whatever. Anyway, the point is she's, she's a she's hot blind. blind girl. He meets Other her. people want to go out with her. Yeah, but she she likes him because he's quiet, shy, and hard to figure out. And so um so she can go to his house and not see all the creepy shit he has everywhere. And that's, you know, cool because she's blind and it's super, it's actually really creepy, you know, like that she's kind of walking past these things that are, yeah. I don't even remember what specifically. All these false teeth and, and I can't remember what else, but yeah. this whole house, this is again the Silence of the Lambs universe. So every house is like this dank and ugly, dark trap. Yeah. It, his house is a mansion, but it still feels like, like you know, this sort of mossy pit where, where there's... The, the disordered minds in the Thomas Harris universe always cause, you know, all surfaces to be covered with clutter. And, and so that's, you know, that's what, what is going on here. But she's blind. So he they can go on a date. He can bring her here. Um, and she doesn't see all that stuff. But, but the thing of it is, just like Norman Bates falling in love with a girl, he actually likes this girl. And so from in his again, disordered mind, he's becoming the dragon, but it just so happens at this inopportune time that he's met a nice girl who he kind of likes. And he and, doesn't want to give her up to the dragon. Right. And that's cool. I mean, this is a really interesting concept. That, that, and that actually you know, does happen in a lot of stories where you have a bad guy who does, who's trying, like, you know, <laughs> do you remember that, that hilarious video with, um, is it Michael Myers or is it Jason who has the... Uh, they kill, 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 and then it's, it's, it's like a music video where he falls oh, in love. Oh, uh, that's that's with Jason. Jason, yeah. and then he's like, he's like, he's written kill, 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 but then he writes don't kill, and he's like trying to write hearts and flowers because he loves this girl right. and he wants to change. And he's like working out. Yeah, and, exactly. And, yeah. and that's the thing. It's, I think that's a really common trope, and I think it's a really a great metaphor for real life, which is, that you have people who whose nature is to be maybe not evil, but at least cold, narcissistic, whatever it is, 
and then they um, are addictive or whatever it is, and then they find someone that they desperately want to be a better person for, but it's uh, hit or hit or miss as to whether they're going to be able to go against their nature to do that, you know, and and how long they'll be able to sustain it. You know, if they're able to change Whoa. for this person, can you really sustain it? Yeah. The the difference here being is that Dollarhide isn't just the narcissist. Dollarhide no, is a homicidal maniac. I'm saying the monsters in the movies are a metaphor for the real life, not not as severe monsters. But it's the same idea, you know. It's like, yeah. Fair enough. I'll I'll I'll, I'll buy that. I mean, it's super sad though. It's tremendously sad because the the real the the, the real truth is, of course, he. He's already been murdering people. He's not going to be able to just say, you know what, I'm done with all of that. I found somebody who accepts me for my cleft palate, and it's all fine. So I'm going to... He would love to be able to I'm going to get over my delusion about the dragon and just, just not... I'm just going to leave that behind. I'm not going to kill anybody else, and I'm going to, like... And and this girl and but I you said the, the key table. word is delusion. Yeah. He is delusional, so he might actually think that you know. Right, but the dragon won't allow him. Okay, right. question. Well, Everybody he wants... does. He thinks that if he eats this painting, he does oh, actually. Right. This is, yeah, he tries. This is where he starts to slip up. Yeah. Is that he goes? He's obsessed with this one painting, which is of the great red dragon. And so yeah. he goes to the museum where they actually have it and somehow pawns the museum and the letting you see it up front. He knocks out two of the women that work there and proceeds to eat this 200-year-old painting. But he yeah. doesn't kill the women. No. He's, no. He's, he's a man on a mission. He's out to eat this William Bill. No, but I'm Blake. saying I'm saying that that's progress because it's progress not protection. <laughs> That he doesn't kill the women because they've seen him. No, you're right. You're right. But as Drew points out, this is the desperate thing that's only going to make it worse for him because everything now is just pointing at who he is. And uh, and it doesn't work anyway because the red the dragon is still alive in his mind. Okay, did anybody hear the version with Frank Langella yelling at him? Because it wasn't in the version that I saw, but I remember it, so I've seen it before. There's yeah, a version of this. Yeah, there's a version where Frank Langella, but it's but it's been cut. The scene, so it must be in like the DVD or something, because it's Frank Langella is the um, the voice of the dragon that that haunts him. It's actually um, this, the the lines are cut. The scene's not cut. Oh. In the version that I saw, Dollar Eyes running around the house, going, "I won't give her to you." Blah blah blah. She's mine and she's nice, you know. And the dragon is going, "You must turn her over," you know. And it's it's Langella. Frank Langella does this voice, and they just cut it. They, um, at least in the version that I watched this weekend with Julia, there's no... Well, and when you look in the IMDb and stuff, it says Frank Langella lines cut. So it's like there's got there's some director's cut. I know cut. I'm not making this up. I no, 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 no. I'm saying that the lines exist, but they've yeah. been cut. So obviously there's like a director's cut or a, yeah. or a it's like, you know... Some alternate well, I know, they, I know they cut stuff because they were worried Will Graham would come across like he was psychic. So maybe they cut that off because they were worried it would come across almost like a, too much like a ghost story like instead of real. something yeah. about no, like... Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the Ellen Burstyn stuff I already thought was a really a little too silly and on the on the nose. I mean, it, I didn't need it at all. The the business of of her yelling it just sounded. It first of all, Ellen Burstyn didn't sound like a real person saying all this stuff. Like I'm going to cut it off. Look what a dirty. Time. It, was, it was like a bad impression of Piper Laurie and Carrie. You know, this yeah. sort of hyper hyper religious mom character. But it didn't. I I just didn't believe it, but I could go with it. I was like, okay, fine, whatever, yes. Um, so I'm fine with them cutting the Langella stuff. Anyway, uh, all of this comes together really quickly. You think we're getting to the end of the movie, but there's actually going to be a twist because um, Dollaride sets his mansion on fire. Well, he, we, we should we should point out that he shoots. He he goes to the blind girl. Uh, he gets jealous after he sees the skeezy yeah. guy at work give the blind girl a ride home. Yeah, yeah. And, and he and shoots him. He, like, kills a, he kills that guy. He brings her to his house, 
And that guy he, also, am I right? Is that the guy that played Parker Lewis? I kept thinking Parker it was. Lewis. Yes. I didn't know. It, is. So. Um, it is? Is it? Okay, well, awesome. I love Parker yep. Lewis. Anyway, so, but he brings her back to the house, and uh, he that's when he's, he's trying to decide if the dragon's going to win, and he's going to have to kill this girl after all. And so he's pointing a gun at her, and um, but then he decides he can't shoot her, and so you see her, you're looking at her, and you hear a gunshot, and she's covered, spattered in blood, and so she's clearly not shot. So then she runs out of the of the of the burning house as the cops and everybody are arriving, and she says, "He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's on the floor. I felt him. He's on the floor." So um, everything's good. Movie's over. And the house everybody's blows happy. Up. <laughs> Everybody's happy. Movie's over. Oh wait, we've got to see Will Graham and and um and uh what's her name? I saw so they uh, wrote her name. Louise before. Parker. Mary, Mary Louise Parker. Yeah. Uh, and their kid in the in this house with the weirdest like closet door as a bedroom door, which just annoyed me. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> so they're just hanging out, you know, whatever. They're hanging out doing s'mores or something. I don't know. So um, kid goes inside and. Sudden, and then they suddenly find out. Well, how do they find out that cops? I guess do they do like a DNA or a dental or something or whatever. They figure out that he's not. It's like, yeah, the dental, dental record. Sorry. It's the dental records. Well, how yeah. do you get a dental record? He uses fake teeth. Well, that's that's why though, because like the one guy, ha- of course, does have teeth, and the, this oh. guy, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh. Well, anyway, so they figure out that that's not him, and so they're trying to get a hold of Will, and in the meantime. They're rushing out there to his to his home, which is across this long this this long bridge, you know, to an island. Wonderful. Uh, this, that's that's all really great. And you have a final battle, which isn't worth recounting blow for blow. Oh, I love the way the, the the I will say I love the way they build up to like with him looking and realizing that all the the mirrors are busted. You know, like I yeah. think that's a good. Slow yeah. build up to the reveal of Dollar Hyde, and I think Dollar this is the, oh, and then Dollar Hyde's holding the the knife to the kid, and he's like, "I'm going to kill the kid," and and uh, and so of course he had read um, Will had read the journals or diaries or whatever something that said that Dollar Hyde had been told by his grandmother all this horrible stuff. Yeah. So Will starts yelling. Oh my God, that's the most heartbreaking part. Will starts yelling all this stuff to the kid because the kid has wet his pants, and so he sees that he's about his kid's about to be killed. He starts yelling at him, and he's like, "Did you wet your pants, you filthy bastard? Da da. You know, you deserve whatever." He starts yelling all this horrible stuff to this poor kid who's going to be traumatized for the rest of his life. Probably will kill his own small animals soon. Uh, and it's like this awful scene where he's just yelling at this kid to. To get to get create some sympathy in or empathy in the part of on the part of Dollar Hyde so that he will go go after Will and, and leave the kid alone, and so that works. Uh, so thankfully. you don't believe that in the in the Hollywood universe we couldn't have a scene right after he goes. You recognize I was kidding with all that stuff, right? Not kidding, but that was saving your life. Yeah, this was all. Yeah, a no, I think you can say that all you want, and the kid's still going to be really fucked up for the rest right, of the life. All right, well, we'll deal with that. Anyway, so uh... <laughs> I don't I don't believe in permanent fuck ups. So I really believe that. <laughs> No matter how daunting something is, you can always work on it. With, yeah, could be, could be, you know. but it'll be therapy. So um, anyway, so he's. I, I have to say, I think that this is the scariest that Ray finds is in the whole movie, like yeah. right here, because like I like Tom Noonan better. Like I, I, I said this. I think like I like this movie better than Manhunter, but I think Tom Noonan overall is a better Dollar Hide. However. Ray Fiennes is really scary right here, you know. Well, Ray Fiennes, the problem with Ray Fiennes, to me, I don't know about you, is only that I know him from so many other things, and he's always so elegant, that it's hard to buy him as a monster because you know him as a thing. But I think he does a great job, personally. I, you know, it's it's not that, because he certainly played his fair share of, of bad guys. Um, he just doesn't look as the way people react to Dollar Hyde is not like like you know they've made Ray Fines look a little you know they've given him the hair lip and everything and you know the Michael Myers jumpsuit and a couple of scenes you know he 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 doesn't look quite as Frankensteinian as Tom Noonan but like 
how could he? Like, how, Tom Noonan really looks like somebody you, you would be like, oh, well, is he sh- as strong as he looks? Because Tom Noonan is this hugely tall yeah. guy. Yeah. And, you know, like, Ray Fiennes, to me, is just not physically imposing enough for the way. Like, I, he would work better for me if they cut out all the lines about people referring to him being a big man because he just does not look that way. Yeah. You know, it's funny you should mention that about Noonan because they don't have to say Noonan would be a bodybuilder because he's just physically so large that he doesn't even have to be in particularly good shape to be extraordinarily strong. You know, he's just a big, tall, kind of gangly, but tall dude. Well, he looks, he's, he looks like Frankenstein. I mean, he played yeah. Frankenstein once, but yeah, he looks yeah, like absolutely. Frankenstein. Yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, although... I will say Rafe is in probably the best shape of his life here. I mean, he's, you know, he's really, he's, he's as built as Rafe Fiennes is ever going to get. You know, he's, he's quite muscular and, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not huge, but you do believe that he could probably punch you really hard. Um, just with Jamie, somebody. Jamie likes, you like, you like this performance a lot. Make your case I, for it. I think he did, does a great job. I think he's, both like creepy and intimidating with those damn teeth. <laughs> like yeah. like that scares me. And then knowing what he did, like if you didn't know we like I know you said it was exploitive earlier, but if you didn't know all the hor- horrendous things that he had actually done to those families, like you would I don't know, when when the tender parts come where you feel like, oh, this, you know, what has he been through to make him so dark? Like, you want the Reba, you know, the the blind girl to save him. You know, you want yeah. that for him. But, you know, it, if he hadn't have done as good a job, you wouldn't have wanted him to want, like, you wouldn't have wanted him to have any sort of happiness at all. And, uh, yeah, you know, right. when they seem like they're falling in love, you know, it's, it's like I said, very tender and not in the way that, like, you'd expect a guy who just brutally raped and murdered a whole family, like, yeah. would be. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it it actually, it tempts you to think for a moment that maybe there's a happy ending for this guy, when of course there isn't. And that's what's, that is something brilliant about Thomas Harris. I mean, he's come up with something really clever here, is for us to actually get invested for a moment in the happiness of this serial killer. Um, uh, you know, only to have it all fall apart. Because well, it's, it's funny yeah. to see that this stuff has stuck around, like the influence of the, because, you know, the, the, the lasting legacy of the series is, of course, Hannibal Lecter. But, you know, yeah. I was, the way they analyze Dollar Height, I see a lot of Dexter in. Yeah. I, you know, like, like it's, it's, it is, weird you know like like people don't like this is a great character like i you know i will say in both versions of this story like this is a really great character and yeah. you know i'm sure i i've never read the book and i i you know doing these movies have made has made me want to maybe go actually finally dive into that but i you know this is a really marvelously conceived character as you know as good as Lecter in some ways yeah no I I agree and it is compelling enough that they've done it three times because although I haven't gotten to these episodes yet Dollar Hyde also dominates an entire season of the television show Hannibal so they because they go and they do this all over again on on the tv series which just starts from scratch and it tells the Will Graham story um, all the way through Silence of the Lambs, which if I'm given to understand, they just retell Silence of the Lambs, only they don't have Clarice in it, but whatever. Um, and I I can't comment on that version of Dollar Eyed because I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Um, but you know what just struck me? You mentioned Frankenstein. Actually, in a sense, the monster being able to find a moment's respite with the blind person is a direct lift from James Wells' Frankenstein. Because yes, able you're to, absolutely right. Yeah, right of Frankenstein. Know, yeah, and you know it's the same thing where suddenly, when the monster is shown kindness, 
our hearts melt. We want things to work out for them, even though, of course, we know that that's not that's not how it's likely to. Well, to work. it's that thing that Julia is saying. Everybody's a little bit monstrous. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, anyway, so they have the uh, scene with the boy. They have the scene where um, they now they're in. He's managed to lock himself and the boy into the the bedroom with the closet door's door, and he and now the wife comes in from outside looking for everyone. Yeah. And so he knows that Delahide is going to be behind her. So he's like the door. I mean, as as awesome as it is. Blow for blow, we don't need the fight. It, it's, the it's, point is, well, the point is that, that that stupid door is super annoying to me because of the, how, like, they can tear apart the door or whatever. But, yes, uh, so they have a shootout. He tells her to duck. They have a shootout. They shoot each other. But, fortunately, he survives. Well, actually, they both survived that shootout. Yeah. So then he opens the door, and then he's – or she opens the door, and um, he he was able to gasp out to her that she should shoot Dollar Hyde again because now he's he's – He's, he's kind he's of once more the, rising, yeah. Right, doing the whole um, the Halloween thing, and so uh, so she shoots him again in the head, and that's the end of that story. And, yeah. And uh, well, it we ends episode, with it ends with Lecter writing Will Gr- Graham, and it's actually probably my favorite Lecter line in this whole movie, where he's he's like uh, any any sensible society would either kill me or put me to good use. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which suggests that there might be lots of these movies. That that instead of the nun that we wind up getting, that there could be, you know, just you know, many many uh, serial killer stories with Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, it helping. could be like uh, like Blacklist, where they just start, be, they have red. Well, it in. could be like the TV series Hannibal. I mean, they finally yeah. did it. They just did it as a television series, you know, and maybe that makes sense. Anyway, so it, it ends with. Well, Hilton. I think I think the thing that you're talking about here is the reason why I think people find Lecter in the cell. I'm okay with Lecter actually being out in the world. I think revisiting Hannibal actually made me like seeing that character with the brakes off. Uh But the thing I think that you enjoy, and I think that, you know, the subliminal thing is, is people prefer the devil in hell. Yeah. This is what we like to see. Yeah. I think that's right. I think that's true. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. I like, I like him to be in this cage, and then you can kind of stick a needle in there and draw some of that out and use it, you know. Um, well, it's but, evil versus evil. People, people, you know, yeah. they want this, this thing kind of. They want it being put to good use because he has this brilliance, and it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of again what they tapped into with Dexter, where you have like a serial killer being pointed in the right direction. And, you know, this is, this is unwittingly, unlike Dexter, who, who very much enjoys uh, divvying out his signature brand of justice. But, uh, you know, it, that's, that's the formulation of what, of what we're starting to see here. Yeah. Um, and um, we have a stinger where it says, yeah. Hey, uh, well, you know, you have a visitor who's supposed to come, but I'll tell her to go away. Mm, and, what's her name? Yeah and, yeah, and Hector asks, well, what is her name? And we know, because Hector? we're primed for it, that it's Clarice. And, and <laughs> it's not like you said Hector. Yeah, Lecter, yeah, he's uh, right, and he's kind of intrigued. But that's, um, that, I mean, again, I find it a little hard to buy just because he does look so different than he looks in that movie, but it's cool. It's a neat little... Well, also, like, I thought that Silence of the Lambs was at least another few years after... I would have thought that. ...the events of this story. Yeah. Like, it is, this makes it seem like it's almost, like, it's immediate. immediately. Yeah, it's immediate. Right. Like, 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 Will Graham, basically, uh, that Will Graham gets better from his wounds, retires, and then uh, Buffalo Bill starts killing. I can only imagine Will Graham just doesn't take their calls, and so yeah. so uh, Clarice Starling is out jogging, and they and they send her to go talk to Lecter. Like all of this yeah. happens in the span of like eighteen months, apparently. Yeah. You know, okay, actually, sure. I can buy that. The reason I can buy that is because I often find when I look back in time that things that happened were actually closer together than I thought. Yeah. You know? um, so I can I, I I can buy that, but it is it is. Uh, uh, it makes your head swim a little bit to watch yourself suddenly run into the beginning of, of uh, 
Silence of the Lambs. Um, so well, again, it does feel it feels a little cheap. Yeah, I mean, it, they did, I think they at that didn't point, did that. anybody realize it's supposed to be the eighties? Well, I mean, Times of the Lambs is like what, like ninety one or something. Like I was saying, it looked to me like the eighties most of the time, but who knows? I mean, to be honest with you, I have no idea what year Science of the Lambs is supposed to be taking place. I, I just literally don't have a feel for it. It could be a post-apocalyptic future. It's like yes. the same continuity as Mad Max. Where everything has been <laughs> rebuilt again to where, to where it looks like 1987 in Baltimore. <laughs> I have to say something. I have to say something. That I, apparently there's a, a, a meme out there that says that Aladdin, the movie Aladdin, uh, actually takes place in a post-apocalyptic future like thousands of years from now because the genie is is saying the last time he was out of his um, bottle, he was it was like thousands of years ago, and then he's got all these pop cult- cultural references from now, from today. So they're saying, like, it's so since they're all, it's so... Um, and so because he can do John Wayne, yeah. therefore he's in our future rather than yeah, our he's past. Too, yeah, so it's like everything is I I love that to, somehow Occam's Razor leads us to Mad Max instead of the idea that the genie just has magic powers and can predict John Wayne somehow. Because he said that he was last time he was out was thousands of years ago, so it makes sense. Because I, I always just thought the genie was like, omniscient. Yeah. Well, and this is not a um, like the outfits that they wear and the and the way things are is not actually how things were in ancient um, what's it uh, 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 Arabia. So Arabia, thank you. Um, so I like that. Anyway, I thought that was a funny theory. So I was like, that's awesome. I like it. Huh. <laughs> for you to You'll ponder. Never have a friend like me. That's my that's my endorsement is to go back and watch Aladdin and th- with that thought in your head. <laughs> so, let's get our final thoughts on Red Dragon. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, and somebody in the uh, in the chat room says that they're just catching up with us and watch Signs of the Lambs last week for the 30th time. So <laughs> you've got a lot of our episodes of our podcast to listen to because we're covering all of these things. So now we're up to Red Dragon. We'll be back next week with Manhunter. So let's go through our final thoughts on the show. Um, so the order we went, Drew. I think it was uh, Drew, Julia, Jamie, and then me. So Drew, final thoughts, Red Dragon. Uh, I think I didn't enjoy this movie at the prior as much as the prior two, I do like it. I do like it better than Manhunter, which I have found is actually a extremely controversial opinion, strangely. Um, however, it, to me, this is still the weakest of the the movies that we've done. It's just it's just not as visually stunning or interesting, but it's, it's, it's certainly if you enjoy the other two, you'll find stuff to enjoy about this. And I, I, I just enjoy Anthony Hopkins chewing scenery as this character (laughs) and chewing on faces at at some point. Uh, (laughs) But uh, so I could, I could, I could, I could always watch more of these if they had made them, but you know, it's 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 just a satisfactory film, even if it's not as good as it could have been. Excellent, uh, Julia. What are your thoughts? Well, I am very easy to please because if I like the actors, I like the film, and so for me, because it's Ray Fiennes, because it's Edward Norton, because it's Anthony Hopkins, Mary Louise Parker to a lesser extent, Emily Watson, I don't really care about. Is that her name? Emily Watson. I think that's right. Uh, but anyway, I, and uh, and I'm not actually a big Philip Seymour Hoffman fan, but I think he's perfect in this film. Um, I like that cast, therefore I like the movie. I did not like Julianne Moore, therefore I didn't like Hannibal as much. Um, so that's it's simple for me, <laughs> mathematically. Um, I, I yeah. So I just think it's it's fun. I think it's like I said, it's it's gonna just be gone from my brain this time next month. But I'm glad we watched it. Excellent. Jamie, where are you landing on this? I like this movie. I still, I, I know Drew's like kind of picked it apart a bit, but I know there's some points where it seems a little unbelievable. All in all, it's, I don't know, it's, it's worth it just for the character study. I feel like um, 
where as you know Buffalo Bill and Hannibal Lecter are just villains straight through um you know this character Ray finds this character you know the the tooth fairy you you just I don't know there's a a a humanity there that isn't with the other two and um I can't really compare to Manhunter because I have only seen that movie one time and I honestly barely remember it. So well, you're uh, going to get a chance. We, we, yeah. <laughs> we, we're going to rock well, it back to the well, 80s next week. But go ahead. Well, what's, what's interesting about doing these two back to back and in reverse order is that, uh, well, for one, we're going to get a, a, another chance to talk about all these characters, and especially I think Do- Dollar Hyde deserved maybe a little bit more of our our yeah. time this go around. But thankfully, since we're doing a, a two for one here, I think uh, we're going to actually be able to give a, a really in depth analysis of of this whole character. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Jamie, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, that was basically, I mean, I was just saying that, you know, the character study on, you know, a serial killer and not making him 100% a villain through and through, um, I just find, you know, it's, it it shows a lot of shades of gray as opposed to it just being super black and white and terrible and, you know, it is terrible what he's done and, my one like flaw that I find in the movie is that I just wish you knew why more. So then, you know, like why wh- you hear the little bits, you know, like the sound bite in the beginning, but what was really done to him? You know, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, being raised with a, 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 you know, being feeling disfigured, you know, feeling like an outsider is something that, makes the character relatable. Everyone has at some point felt, you know, physically different than everyone around them. And, you know, I don't know, but I feel like this, it could, have, you know, it, it doesn't exactly uh, reach its mark, you know, where it probably should have um, or could have, but it's still, it's still entertaining to watch. So, yeah. It's, it's funny to think, that these details are introduced there to tell us a little bit more about the particular pain of these characters like Francis Dollaride or James Don- James Gunn. But at the same time, they clearly aren't enough to make that character. In other words, like many people are abused and don't become serial killers, you know. And you know, or or ma- many people are mentally ill and are are and and that doesn't mean that they're a danger to anybody. But nevertheless, the ingredients themselves are just ingredients to this particular souffle, and and you know, so I, it's it's always strange to me. I'm not complaining at all, but Harris gives us these backgrounds, but they're just backgrounds. They're not a, they're not a recipe to make a serial killer, and uh, you know, so I I it's it, it it's just funny to think like where is the actual serial killerness born and does it have anything to do with these bad things or could you take francis dollaride and have him not have a cleft palate and have him grow up in a totally different home and would some strange kernel within him still have him become the tooth fairy i i that's that's what i'm really curious about in other words are these just details you know and to what extent are they are they a serial killer recipe i have no idea um anyway yeah where is the serial killer bred or in the heart or in the head? Uh, I love, you know, I, I, I love parts of this, but I'm still a big Manhunter fan. I can't wait to, to discuss uh, Dollar Ride next week. Um, I, I have to say, we're going to stop the Lecter series with Manhunter, so we're not going to get into Hannibal Rising. But it's just as well, because to me, I like these sort of origin stories of the serial killers that they hunt. But I am happy with Lecter where he is here, basically with no explanation whatsoever about what the hell makes Hannibal Lecter Hannibal Lecter. 
I actually don't need to know. It's not necessary for me to know that that you know that his family were refugees. I just what the you know what the hell does that exactly give me? He's more interesting to me as a sort of living Mephistopheles who can see into the hearts of all other men. That's all I want from Hannibal Lecter. Uh, so we'll be back with more Hannibal Lecter next week. We'll be talking about Brian Cox, but it'll give us a chance to talk also in uh, comparison about the power of Anthony Hopkins. So let's do endorsements, uh, whatever it is that you're watching or recommending or, or what have you. Uh, same direction. I think we started with Drew. Drew, what do you got for us this week? Selfish, selfish, self-plugging. Uh, I have started writing for yet another uh, website called – it's a, a website that actually hits very off the beaten path of uh, everything we talk about here because it's a website that deals with workers workers' rights and, and workers' issues. And it's called The Underemployed Life. Um, I have p- just put up my first piece today. It just went live around, I would say, 5 o'clock today. Oh, and it's fabulous, by the way. It is a fabulous piece. Oh, thank piece. you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it's... it's <laughs> Anybody who follows me on Facebook or Twitter has, has seen me post this sort of weird um, scenario that has happened where I will be out working at my day job um, and I will get, I guess the, the best, the best um, way to phrase this is to, that I will get accosted by comic book fans who recognize me at, <laughs> during my day job and yeah. you know i'm not a particularly super famous comic book creator yet this has happened to me multiple times in the last few years and i i've always wanted to kind of articulate why i you know why i think people do that have to get, they act disappointed when they see me working a regular, like in a regular environment, working a regular job, and that I'm suddenly not this. Well, more than whatever. Point is, it's something strange, because they've said you said that people have have come out. They get angry. Don't they get actually so get you antagonistic. Have lied to people, and and I, I don't even understand exactly what it is. What is the lie? What is the ripoff that they feel like you've pulled over on them? I I you know I go into it in 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 you know in depth in the piece and and you know I posted it on our our Facebook, but I think it's because of people's expectations. You know they they want to, I I think they they somehow think that you put yourself above them by putting yourself out there in the public eye when, you know, that's not the case. You don't, you don't actually go into doing what we do thinking that way. You just want to tell your, tell yeah. your stories and the format that you've chosen to tell them at. And, you know, if you, if you achieve even like a small amount of celebrity doing that, you're very, very fortunate because it's tough doing that in yeah. the comic book industry at this point in time. You know, and I also think though that's because comic book culture appears to be everywhere and yeah. so there's this sort of misconception that anybody that's involved with that must be filthy stinking rich for some reason, which is of course not well, but what's funny to me about that is that so you could be a comic book creator and be middle class comic book creator and be working class, you could do whatever the hell. But I mean, what I, I does I'm just trying to understand where the unhappiness of the viewer comes from. I'm trying to figure out if it's they feel like, well, I don't want to support somebody who's not already being self supported by their I don't understand. I, I, I really I don't Well know what and it's the, I, I don't fully understand the mentality but that's that's, that's that's why I, I wrote this that's why I wrote this piece is because I wanted to, you know, kind of take all this weird negativity that I've experienced and put it into something positive and maybe, you know, start a dialogue about this. Like I kind of hope somebody who maybe somebody who's done this to me will actually read this and then write me and go, okay, this is, this is why I reacted this way. You know, like 
and I can I can give you one concept, which is that they might be thinking, in my mind, if I can just do X thing, like if I can sell some songs or if I can sell a comic book, I'll be lifted out of my day to day life, my need to have a day job, my need to do whatever. And so you meet somebody who you think has accomplished that, and they haven't done it either. And suddenly, you suddenly the tunnel that stretches on before you gets longer. And I can imagine that being disturbing. Well, uh, especially if they have, I think the uh, what what I call the appearance of success. Yeah. You know, like uh, you know, or relative success. You know, yeah. so like you talk about being middle class. Like uh, you know, I'm definitely coming from a more like I'm working class. I don't, I wouldn't even say like I'm. I'm, you know, like maybe, you know, like like what I would think of as like upper middle class. I, I have a very blue collar job and I, I, you know, I'm not ashamed of that, but people's reactions is, is interesting, but I, I, I'm very proud of this piece. We worked very hard on it. Um, I, I hope people will read it. I, I, I really am encouraging feedback. So if you read it on the, the household horror, uh, Facebook group, Write me and tell me what you think about this because I, you know, I'm going to be doing more pieces for the site, and you know, it's a little outside of my comfort zone. So I think I'm stretching myself as a writer because, you know, most of the stuff I write about is geared towards, you know, you know, I write a lot of fiction and I write a lot of film criticism. This is this is a different animal altogether. So I I I really hope people enjoy what what I'm going to be doing for this website. Sounds cool. Awesome. Uh, Julia, do you have anything to endorse for us this week? Oh, gosh, I don't have anything that nearly that interesting or important. I was just thinking um, about, when I was thinking, talking about the Aladdin thing earlier, I was thinking about the um, Honest trailer for Aladdin. Hmm. So I, I'm, I'm endorsing Honest trailers, Literal videos, and bad lip reading. And all of those things are things, too, if you haven't read, seen them. Google them and then spend the next 24 to 48 hours <laughs> watching them endlessly. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, okay, yes, I'm with you, uh, by the way, on on Honest Trailer, certainly. Uh, all right, Miss Jamie, what about you? <clears throat> well, uh, I recently watched the first, well, most of the first season um, of Aquarius. Uh, that David Duchovny uh, show where he's, it's kind of like X-Files meets Dragnet uh-huh. uh, meets Charles Manson. <laughs> so it's okay. just, uh, I don't know, it takes some some very, art, I'd say artistic liberties might be giving it a little bit of a, of a lenient hand, but it's not a, I don't know, it's it's been all right to watch so far. Um, I wish I had something m- more enthusiastic. I've been about, but um, I haven't really watched or done anything too exciting recently. <laughs> um, it's like I can always say if you you know if you're in the Austin area and you're looking for something to do with your kids for summer, or I say kids, your daughters, uh, Girls Rock Austin is accepting. Uh, spots for their July camp and their August camp still. So um yeah. but yeah, that's that's all that's I that's all she wrote. <laughs> I, I I just as a follow up to Aquarius, I haven't seen Aquarius and I heard that it was really good. Uh but I did listen to at the same time there was uh, a series of about seven parts if I recall of uh, the podcast You Must Remember This, which covered the Manson period in L.A., and it's absolutely fabulous because it went into just all the different things going on in, you know, music and politics and the movies and all the different crazy players coming around L.A. at the time of the growth of the Manson family, what the Manson family was up to, why they went on their killing spree, what insane and largely just completely lucky way that they got killed got uh, sorry got uh caught and amazing stuff so yeah just as a companion to your endorsements um i will go watch aquarius but and people should check out uh you must remember this next time they have a long uh car ride uh all my my last thing i wanted to endorse is i've been reading um 
so I was asked to do an introduction for one of the uh, Erie reprint archives for uh, Dark Horse. So I've been rereading Erie, and uh, I'm reading this miniseries from Doug Mensch that was in Erie back in 1980. And it's so good. It's called Blood on Black Black Satin, and it's it's completely you know reporter goes into a little town and and there's an Aleister Crowley type cult that's rising up and you know they're kidnapping people fabulous just just fabulous Paul Galassi art I mean this is wonderful stuff so if you have an opportunity to go pick up some old Erie magazines uh great or or you can wait for the reprint that that I'm doing now but Dark Horse is has been doing a bunch of these archives for several years, and you should de definitely check it out. Erie Magazine was a horror anthology uh, comic magazine. You know, every issue would have like three or four stories each, and, and they were wonderful um, back uh, back before a lot of you were born. So, um, and that is our show. The uh, thank you for being with us. If you're listening for the first time, there's an awful lot of episodes to go back and check out. We'll be back next week with Manhunter. If you like the show, please leave a review for us on iTunes. It gives us something to read to one another when we are when we are cold and lonely. <laughs> and uh, come on the Facebook page. We would love to talk to you. Hang in there. Everyone have a fantastic week, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Good night. Bon appetit. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Bye.